Well, good morning, church. So, man, I'm so thankful that all of you are here today. And we had such a great turnout for our Christmas Eve services as well. And so I want to say thank you to all of you. And please be safe when you go home today. You know, that's extremely important to us. But uh, today, instead of me just sharing by myself, we thought we would do something a little bit different. And we wanted to make this um, sort of a, rem- a memorable experience because we knew we were going to have several kids in here as well. Now, some of you, you get nervous because your kids are in here and all the noise they're going to make and stuff like that. Do not worry about it. It doesn't bother me at all. I have five kids and I'm just sort of used to the noise by now, okay? And I think there's nothing greater than to have kids really in a church because it shows that we're a growing place, you know? And so and even Jesus, he welcomed those little ones to him. So kids, guess what? After service today, you're all getting one of these. M&Ms. Now, it's going to be very important that you focus today because we're going to use the M&Ms to tell the Christmas story today. And so um, instead of me just doing all by myself, I'm going to ask the pastors uh, to come up here this morning and they're going to help tell the M&M story about Christmas. And Bo, if you wouldn't mind lighting those uh, candles too, if we can... uh So just so you know, these are our pastors here on staff. And uh, so I'm going to introduce you, uh, if I can remember their names. Uh, This is Alex. Uh, He's our youth pastor. And uh, he's been with us for some time. And then Colleen, uh, she's in charge of discipleship here at Dayspring. And she's going to be taking a little bit of a break, going to enjoy the warm weather in Florida. And then she'll be back to help us, I believe, in April. And uh, so there's Pastor Dylan. He does our online and he takes care of all of our tech stuff as well. And then uh, Pastor Bo, he takes care of the children's programs. And so, and uh, he and I are related. If you don't know, he married my sister. Somebody had to, you know, so Bo got that uh, job, okay? So anyways, we appreciate that too. It cleaned up our family name, by the way, you know. She took out the Osborne and made her Hummel. So uh, anyway, so we're going to tell this story, but as I tell this story, um, I want to give you the poem that is with this Eminem Christmas story, and it goes like this. As you hold these candies in your hand and turn them, you will see the M becomes a W, an E, and then a 3. They tell us the Christmas story. It's one I'm sure you know. It took place in a stable a long, long time ago. The E is for the east, where the star shone oh so bright. The M is for the manger, where the baby Jesus slept that night. The three is for the wise men bearing gifts, they say they came. W is for worship, hallelujah, praise his name. So as you eat these candies or share them with a friend, remember the spirit of Christmas and never let it end. Merry Christmas. All right, so we're going to spend some time talking about these. And I have to tell you, um, I'm probably more traditional on my M&Ms. I like just the basic M&Ms, okay? They got these many M&Ms that my son really loves. Now, what's the point? You know, like I want the bigger ones, you know. And I have to tell you that my kids were debating this. Some like the peanut M&Ms. I like the peanut M&Ms. Peanut butter M&Ms are pretty good too. Some of the kids were talking about pretzel M&Ms, which I didn't even know about that, you know. Uh, Some of them mentioned the caramel ones. Not a big thing for me. Um, And then the, the brownie ones, nah, I'm not going there again, okay. It was just too rough. And so the reason I tell you which ones I like and don't like is I don't want you to think I'm getting a sponsorship for this today, okay? I'm getting nothing out of this for M&Ms. But anyway, so we're going to tell the story. And uh, we decided to start with uh, Pastor Alex because he just loves to get up front here and uh, (laughs) preach and stuff. So we're going to start with him today. We definitely all know that's not true. (laughs) No, I'm just kidding. I love being up here sometimes, not uh, in this form, but maybe goofing off. But I get uh, the eminem of E, which is East, and that comes from Matthew 2, 1 through 2. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the East came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. See, as I read this passage, I think it's kind of a little crazy because there's these men that are in the east and they look up and they see this star and it's like, oh, okay. Well, I'm going to be honest. I don't look at the stars enough to know if something is new or if something was not new. Uh, And so for me, I wouldn't be able to tell. But for them, this was their ordinary. This is something they were looking for and they would have been able to tell what it was. And see, with the uh, wise men here, they 
were someone that we don't really know much about. We don't really have an identity to them. But traditionally, they would probably have been someone who was royal or somebody who had some knowledge of astrology or something of that nature through what tradition tells us. And so these guys, in their ordinary, saw a star. And see, for myself, the star that I saw in my ordinary uh, that brought me to Christ or led me to Christ so that I would worship him was my wife. Uh, when I was sitting in a lunchroom, the ordinary, uh, she walked in and there was this glow about her that something was different. And so you would say that that is my star, and she led me to church, and then which led me to Christ and began this journey, and which is now why I'm here. And so for some of you, you're in that same boat. You're maybe looking or you were led here by something. And so some of those might have been a coworker that you work with. Maybe it's because your family's always done this, and that's why you were led here. Maybe through a friend who just loved you unconditionally, and you're just like, why did you love me when I was just not very good? Uh, maybe through a dream. Maybe God spoke to you through a dream. Maybe you were trying to escape from reality, and you landed in church, which should be a safe place for you. Maybe you picked up the Bible and just wanted to know what was in it. Ultimately, I don't know what brought you here, but you do. But something keeps bringing you back. Something keeps bringing me back. And for me, it's the fellowship, it's authenticity, it's love, and it's peace. It's you guys. I love being with you, and truly, it's one of those things where I can see God and people, and I know that his presence is here. It's something I have to look for in this world, but his presence is there, and something keeps bringing me back. And so my question for you today is what brought you here, and what keeps bringing you back? Um, before he goes on, I want you to know that I think he got in trouble with his wife this morning and had to say something nice about her. So, you know, I just want to put that out there, you know. For I wanted to wear PJs. Okay. <laughs> I'm rewriting my whole thing. <laughs> well, M is for manger. And the scripture is Luke 2, 6 through 7. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. There was no room for them in the inn. So let's unpack these verses together. There. Where is there? Well, Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem with a lot of other people. You see, there was this census going on, and it was very busy in Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem and began to look for a room, there was none to be found. They didn't have phones where they could call ahead for reservations. And by the way, did you know the word Bethlehem means house of bread? Hold that thought. Let's continue in the scripture. The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. So our very young Mary, probably a teenager, gave birth to her firstborn son, Jesus, our King of glory, the Son of God. He came down from heaven, and Mary wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger? So his very first night on earth as a human baby... He was laid in a manger. Now, the Latin word for manger means to eat. So this manger that served as a feeding trough for animals became the crib for our baby Jesus, the King of Glory. So let's do a necessary recap. Mary and Joseph came to a town, Bethlehem, meaning house of bread, they're forced to stay in a place like a stable where Jesus lay in a manger that serves as a feeding trough for animals to eat? How can this be? So in my wonder, I thought, what if the manger actually pointed to Jesus' purpose? Why did he come to earth? Are you starting to see some connections? Bread, body, eating, Bethlehem, manger, Jesus. Jesus' purpose began in that manger as he offered himself as bread for our souls. In the manger, we find essential nourishment for our spiritual journey. Actually, 
Everything we need to satisfy us lies in that manger. Jesus. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? Are you willing to make room for Jesus in 2023? Look in the manger. You know, while you were doing that too, while you were talking about the bread, it was funny because Alex was over here going, mmm. Mm. And uh, I don't know if he was talking more, if he was uh, more enjoying the food or <laughs> the actual lesson and stuff. So. But great, the great, great things. Uh, you didn't hear the kid out there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure it was a kid. It was probably one of the adults. Pesic- yeah, Pesicoli yeah. said, are you hungry? And he's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Time to eat. Did your parents not feed you this morning? No, no I didn't thought there. so. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't even hold it together. I knew. All right, uh, we're going to try to get this back on track here. Uh, I don't know why they put us two last. (laughs) This is awful. I put us together, all right? I'm going to be the number three. So I'm going to look at Matthew 2, 1 to start. And it says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem. So Pastor Alex read the NIV version of this where it said Magi. And I picked the NLT because I think this is a better translation for what we were trying to understand about these people is these were wise men from the East. And everyone assumes it was three kings that came to visit Jesus. And if you think about any uh, nativity set that you have at home, you're going to think that there's three wise men, three kings that came to see Jesus. But we really don't know how many people there were. We don't know how many wise men they were. We do know that they brought three gifts. That's the three, and that's what we're representing three here. So these wise men from the east were probably astrologers, which is often translated. Could be wise men, could be magi, could be sorcerers. There's a whole bunch of different translations that we use for this word magos. That's the, the Greek word there. So for our understanding and what we're looking at, we're looking at three wise men or wise men, not three wise men, three gifts that came from these wise men from the east. And what were those gifts? So let's look at that. Matthew 2.11 says this, Then they opened their treasures and presented him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And again, we have all these interpretations during Christmas time, and we, we think these three kings are coming to bow down to the the heavenly king, and they brought these gifts, but we really don't know why they brought the gifts. But what we do know when we look at these three different gifts is these were definitely gifts that were for royalty. I mean, to think about the expense that it would cost to bring these gifts is great. And so what we have to understand, and we have to put away all the interpretations and Beautiful Christmas stories that we see at the nativity of these wise men coming. What we have to see and what's in the text, we have, to, we have to follow the text, is that we have these wise men bringing gifts that were for royalty, and they were laying them at the feet of Jesus. That's what the text tells us. That these gifts that they were bringing were of high value, and they would normally be for royalty. And these Gentile believers were coming to see the king of the Jews. And King Herod, a Jew himself, wanted to reject Jesus. And so what we see in the text is a foreshadow of what's to come, where the Jews will reject Jesus, and the Gentiles will be the ones that accept him. John, what is it? John 1.11 says, He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. So in the text, we see this foreshadowing of what's to come in Jesus' life. But when we look at this story and Jesus coming into this world, these wise men come to Jesus and lay their gifts at his feet. And so my question for you today, and, and Pastor Bo is going to get into to worship here, is when we are called to worship Jesus, are you willing to lay all of your gifts at his feet? And to use those gifts to further the kingdom. And it might be a gift of giving. You're really good at giving, so you're really generous with your time or your money. That's a gift that you can give. And we have a bunch of kids in the, in the audience today. Maybe you can't give a lot of money, but you can give your time, your efforts. 
for the kingdom. So we need to look at our lives and see what gifts we can lay at the feet of Jesus to further our worship. Because that's all the wise men could do when they saw Jesus was lay their gifts down and worship him. Uh, before Bo get, I'm, the one thing I'm a little bit concerned about is um, I think the message that we might be sending here is that there's four wise men up here and then one wise woman. And I'm afraid that it says that it takes four men to equal one woman. You know what I'm saying? And, so, and some of you probably will agree with that today. So anyways. Well, he hasn't talked now I have the mic. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. I would like to say one thing. Two things. First of all, Pastor Chuck threw me under the bus for marrying his sister. But have you seen Ken and Wes? Wouldn't you pick Nicole too? <laughs> Just saying. I mean, I like you, Ken. Wes, you're all right too, but mm. let's be honest. I pick you every day, honey. Mm. My, kids are, my kids are about to vomit. Over. My kids are embarrassed. I'll kiss you later. Okay, second of all, I would like to note that I'm the only one up here who dressed like an M&M. Mm. W is for worship. I'm got green. Hallelujah. Praise his name. See, I think it's one thing for us to prepare for worship, but it's a whole other thing altogether for worship to just happen. It's highly likely that you got up today prepared for worship this morning. Some of you got up extra early to get your kids ready. Some of your kids got up extra, extra early this morning, and that's why you're ready today. And here at church. And you came preparing to worship. You knew there'd be songs, carols, hymns that would lead you in worship. We'd be reading God's word and that would lead you into worship. And I hope right now through this experience you are worshiping. But there's something different that happens for those unprepared, unexpected, maybe even unmanufactured moments of worship that we sometimes miss those small miracles that do something different altogether, that thrust our knees down to the ground, our eyes up to the heavens, and our hearts in complete surrender. The text I'm reading today is Luke 2, 20, and looking at the shepherds. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. These were Jewish shepherds, so they're a lot like you. They are not unaccustomed to understanding worship. Along with all these feasts that they have throughout the Jewish calendar that led them to worship, they would have gone to the local synagogue weekly and, like you, sang songs, or in their case, psalms, which would have led them in worship. They would have unfolded God's word. At that time, was just the Old Testament. And they would have worshipped just like you and I did today. But I'm sure none of that compared to the worship they were experiencing as they were returning back from spending an evening staring face to face with a sleeping, cooing, spitting Savior. I'm sure none of the worship before could have compared to the shout, shouting, the laughing, the singing, the giggling, the crying, the sighing that would have been their expressions of worship as they went back to the fields. Shouting because <laughs> they literally saw God. Only people like Moses could have said the same thing throughout their lineage. The laughter that of all the people that were invited to see God, it was us. It's almost a joke. The singing, they would have grown up singing psalms, even psalms that were specifically used when kings entered into the city. And now they were singing psalms of a king who was now entering their universe. Who was in a stable just down the street from them. Worship through crying. Which might have been nothing more than the release of emotions. You know how it is. For them it was the complete oppression of being the least of these. The forgotten of society. And now. No words. 
just a release of tears that come when the load has been lifted that you are not forgotten anymore. And worship that comes through just a sigh. For years, now their soul can rest because those thousands of years of promises about a savior, a redeemer, a messiah coming to save him, to save the world, they didn't have to wonder anymore if it was going to happen. It's happening right before their eyes. God was still working. It's kind of a relief. I found that the best moments of worship are the most spontaneous, these unmanufactured ones because I know someone didn't do that to me. I know I didn't make it up. I know it was God who started the whole thing. God caused the shouting, the laughing, the singing, the giggling, the crying, the sighing. Shouting at the good news that maybe your son or daughter just got married or just got engaged. Laughing because that bonus check you received in the mail that you didn't expect, God took care of you at just the right time. How cool is that? The singing. The singing because neither silence nor words can express the peace that you feel coming from God alone, even though that uncurable diagnosis still is staring you in the face. Giggling, because that blanket of snow you see out there this morning, no architect engineer or interior designer could ever recreate that with their hands, which God created with his words only. Crying in worship as you thank God that someone you so dearly loved was granted relief from their bodily pain of this life as they took one last breath and left their pain-filled life and walked into his pain-free, worship-filled presence. And worship through sighing because then and now, God is with us. And very soon, we're all going to be with him. Well, I want to say thanks to... Um all these guys and ladies for helping us out this morning and telling the Eminem story. Okay, kids, we're going to do a little quiz and see if you remember, okay? You ready, kids? you got to be loud on these. What's the E for? There we go. Okay, some of you are out there. Some of you are paying attention. What's the M for? Very good. What's the three for? The gifts, yeah. Wiseman, yep. And then what is the W for? We're excellent. There, you gave me able to tell the story today. I just wish they so, listened that well to me when I teach them on Sunday mornings too. Yeah. <laughs> Killing me, Smalls. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, on the way out today, you're going to get uh, one of these for the kids and stuff. And we have extras. I mean, I don't care if the adults take them as well. Uh, we also have some leftover uh, stuff from yesterday we want to give to the kids also, um, as well. And so just really excited. But I want to reiterate one little thing that we talked about last night in the message. And um, it's just interesting to me. Um, when we think about a big God becoming very small to make a major difference in our world, the message that was proclaimed was one that really brings us freedom. It does bring us hope. It gives us the sense of peace. We experience joy, and we know love through what he did. And I thought about Mary, and, uh, and it, was, it was one of the things I reiterated yesterday, but this whole idea of Mary having to go through the process of carrying this baby. And I can't imagine sort of the weight of, of that. I mean, not just physically weight. I mean, just the weight of having God's son inside of you, caring for him, raising him. And, and Joseph it basically had to adopt him as well. And they had to care for them together. And, but I have to tell you, like, even though she bore Christ to the world, it was Jesus who would bear the cross for our salvation. Mary sang that song of praise and thanksgiving. 
the others who saw that baby as well and recognized he was this Messiah, they praised as well. You know, one of the experiences, if, um, if you've been there, is uh, I remember my wife when, and I said this yesterday, when uh, we had our, well, any of our children, but especially the first one, I remember all that sort of pain that she was going through and you know I'm sitting there trying to help out in the process and trying to be as supportive as I can but I remember seeing all that pain that she was going through and I thought oh man like me she is a trooper and she is so strong uh, for doing this and I'm not saying that because I got in trouble either like I just remember that (laughs) happening and uh, I I just kept thinking boy I hope this hurries up because I don't know if she can stand much more of this and um, I remember when they place Chase into her arms. And I remember, man, just the, the breakdown that she had and the breakdown that I had. I mean, you felt so much love in that moment that you really forget about all that pain that you went through. And when I think about Jesus, and I recognize that all the pain that he ended up going through, being rejected by people, being spit upon, being slapped really by the high priest or one of the people in the synagogue that day, being beaten over and over again and then putting, being put on a cross and mocked and stripped down to everything and just really bleeding out. Having what he considered God forsake him in that moment like he was in this lowliness and he felt the weight of sin. And I thought all that pain that he went through. But at the end of it, why? Because of you and because of me. His love for us was so intense that he said all this pain that I go through is worth it for my creation. And so...